We have a handful of folks who are joining us online, and we have a good number of folks here in the room. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to today's Tuesday topic. Uh, my name is Darren Dunstan. I'm the coordinator of Tuesday Topics. Uh, today's topic is the ins and outs of a seemingly easy cancer of thyroid cancer. I just want to put in a plug for the next couple that we have coming up uh, and remind those folks who are tuning in at home, if you can mute your microphones, that would be terrific. Um, and if you have questions, you can go ahead and just fire them into the chat and I'll raise them to the group uh, as they become necessary. Um, so next week we have uh, effective interdisciplinary communication promoting safe patient care. And then the week after that, how to craft an argument. Uh, some more exciting Tuesday topics that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. All on Tuesdays, all from 12 to 1. Um, and one other reminder, uh, last Tuesday we launched a Tuesday Topics Audience Satisfaction Survey. Uh, it would be great to get some more responses to that. So check your email. When out last Tuesday, we're going to launch it again this Tuesday or today um, as a reminder. And then on your way out the door, if you could fill out some uh, comment cards on your sense of today's topic. It'll help us, it'll help our presenters going forward have a better sense of what worked, what doesn't work, where we can improve. All right, thank you so much and let's go ahead and start with the panel. Roberta, you want to start or Scott, you want to start? Well, I, I'm Scott Horowitz. I'm not actually on the panel today. I'm here um, facilitating. I don't want to say moderating. Moderating feels like a debate where there's disagreement. Um, and but I'm here uh, in this role. I'm a faculty member here in the college in the Department of Creative Arts Therapies, but also have served the last couple of years as co-chair of the Interprofessional Practice Education and Research Collaborative. Um, so we've been trying to explore all sorts of different healthcare situations in which interprofessional care is really essential. And I think we'll hear from the panel today about the importance of coordinated and interprofessional care around thyroid cancer. Um, I'm Roberta Perry. I am communications manager here at the CNHB, but I am also a thyroid cancer survivor. And this was something that um, I brought to Darren that I was interested in doing, especially around um, interprofessional education, because as a thyroid cancer survivor, there's a very set um, kind of treatment plan for us. And I think there's a lot that's missing from it. So I was very interested in kind of approaching this with you know, our panelists and just kind of hoping to, I don't know, educate people about what, what is seemingly easy cancer that really is not. My name is Beth Cottrell. I'm a thyroid cancer surgeon um, and I, I operate over at uh, Jefferson University. I trained over at Penn. So I've been in Philadelphia for about almost nine years now. Um, I uh, got in touch with uh, Roberta through um, the FICA Association, the Thyroid Cancer Survivors Association, which now thankfully has two chapters. We just have one, now we have a second one that just, um, just started in April. Um, and um, they basically kind of came, came to that meeting to talk to people, kind of give my experience, then answer some questions. Um, and she approached me about uh, being on this panel. So um, I am also a head and neck cancer surgeon. So I don't just do thyroid cancer, I do a lot of other uh, cancers of the head and neck as well. Um, and so I can kind of talk today a little bit about what is currently in place for those cancers and how that's different from what we currently have in place for thyroid cancer and how we could maybe improve um, the, the group for thyroid cancer to be a little bit more like our big head and neck cancer panel. So. Hi, I'm Laura Lynch. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the counseling and family therapy department. Um, so my background is mostly in collaborative care in medical family therapy. We did a fellowship in collaborative care in Chicago. I've worked across medical settings, um, and I've done some research in creating uh, evidence-based interventions for couples coping with cancer. So I've worked mostly across cancer types, um, and in joining this panel and talking to Roberta, I've gotten to learn a lot more kind of specifics around the experience of thyroid cancer. So here I talk about kind of that mental health aspect and how to support the couples and families and keep that couple healing lens when we're supporting patients. So maybe a good place to start is talking about, um, can each of you kind of share from your perspective, who makes up that interprofessional team when it comes to thyroid cancer? Um, what, what individuals are a part of that team? What individuals, in your opinions, need to be a part of that team that, that are or are not, or are not as active, and, and um, 
you know, a little bit about what their roles might be. I can maybe start with um, with what kind of is the current sort of model. Um, and Roberta, you may have experienced or not experienced some, some or all of this, um, but at least at, at most academic centers, I would say that the model consists of um, obviously the patient, um, whatever family members can and want to be involved, um, but then also um, the surgeon, the endocrinologist, um, and usually the patient's PCP or primary care physician. Um, that tends to be the kind of case that, that usually is, is the only people that are involved. Um, a lot of times also for um, patients who are coming from a community setting where maybe endocrinologists are hard to find, um, their primary care physician may be trying the best they can to act as that endocrinologist as well. Um, generally speaking, um, oncologists and radiation oncologists, medical oncologists and radiation oncologists are not usually pulled in unless it is a, specifically a very advanced cancer or a more uh, aggressive form of cancer, for example, medullary or anaplastic thyroid cancers, which make up uh, less than 5% of all thyroid cancers. So it's pretty rare for us to have an oncologist or um, radiation oncologist that is part of that team, but they do get pulled in when needed. But that's kind of, that's, that's what it is currently. I can, I'll let somebody else talk about what, what would be good because mm -hmm. we all have thoughts on that. Um, that was my experience that, and actually I wasn't even referred to an academic institution, I went to a community hospital and had a general surgeon, and um, there was a lot of, you know, missteps in that whole uh, scenario. Um, and then I found my way after my uh, tumor markers were not decreasing, I found myself down at Johns Hopkins to receive treatment. And what I had gone through and then what I went through there was, you know, completely night and day. And it was more of the experience of the current model that you were speaking of. Um, that was basically, I started with an endocrinologist. They referred me to surgeons, but they worked together. Um, and then I had already had radioactive iodine, so that wasn't going to be on the table again. Um, so that wasn't part of the team. But, you know, and, and going back and forth to Hopkins isn't, the easiest thing in the world. Um, sometimes it actually takes less time to get to Hopkins than it does go from where <laughs> I live in Philadelphia. Um, but, you know, they have the cytopathologists that are there and, you know, it's a whole thing, but it's, I don't know, I think the team needs to be a little bit more, um, well, it definitely needs to be more ex expanded, especially just mental health is so lacking. I would say on the front of, um you know, in terms of the, the title of this panel, the ins and outs of a seemingly easy cancer, one of the reasons why I think um, it's important to talk about this stuff is that patients do get sent to just any old general surgeon because, hey, it's thyroid cancer, it's easy, it's, you know, no, no big nuance, but we're finding not only more and more is there a lot of nuance actually in thyroid cancer, but also we're finding, and we've found for decades now that higher volumes mean better outcomes in terms of surgery. Higher volumes also mean better outcomes in terms of just your endocrinologist. So if you go to an endocrinologist or a PCP who's never really dealt with thyroid cancer or you know, tends to um, focus mostly on diabetes, you, you, know, you may not have the, somebody who's really as up to date on the things that are uh, you know, new staging or, or um, new drugs that are out there to treat things. So um, that, that's also important. And I'll let you talk about the mental health. I mean, I think ideally we'd love to see um, a behavioral health person, person actually embedded in the clinic. So whether it's primary care or we're talking working with um, the endocrinologist or the surgery team, um, that can help to have those boots on the ground, to have those relationships with the other healthcare providers um, to actually kind of be not just an advocate for the patient, but to be there in that kind of initial crisis when the diagnosis is given, um, to be able to kind of pop in as needed when things come up, um, and to also provide kind of brief targeted interventions to the, the patient and the family as well. Um, so that's sort of the ideal, right? We call that sort of level five collaboration where someone's involved, but that's not always, doesn't always happen. So if that's not available, then, you know, physicians and therapists in the community or community-based uh, mental health can form relationships. So there are therapists who have um, a lot of experience working with couples and families and patients coping with 
illness and chronic illness, and if they can form those collaborative bonds, that means that they have a referral source, so that when the primary care doctor or the endocrinologist sees a patient struggling, or hopefully for any patient, kind of lets them know, hey, this is an option for you, this has been helpful to other patients, to have someone to talk to as you walk through this and navigate this, and actually be able to give them <coughs> some names and a connection of someone that they've worked with before. Um, so I think, again, having those resources there, even if it's not that ideal part of the clinic team sitting in all the meetings talking about the patients to at least have that level of the referral source and ongoing relationship. And also so that a therapist once referred can call back and talk to the patient <coughs> with the permission of the patient and saying, you know, the patient is really kind of struggling or confused around this aspect. I wonder if this is something you could talk to the patient about or if maybe we can set up a time where all of us can actually just sit in a room together. Um, so, you know, that, that can be very helpful to um, a patient and family. And I think also for having the behavioral health side of things is to think about, okay, um, where is this family at developmentally? Where are they at in their family life cycle? So getting that diagnosis at a time where a couple is thinking about having children versus someone who's maybe farther in life and was kind of expecting a happy <coughs> retirement. Um, there's all sorts of implications depending on when that diagnosis takes place. And so a behavioral health provider can kind of help remind um, physicians of some maybe specific issues to talk about related to that as well. And to, to kind of build on that, I think that there, there are some times that we um, find like, oh, behavioral health is so obviously needed in this particular circumstance, for example, with anaplastic thyroid cancer. I don't think that there's ever been a time that I've diagnosed someone with anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is almost universally fatal within about six months um, and, and represents less than 1% of thyroid cancers. But when we do make that diagnosis, that is, that is a, you know, anyone would say that that's a life-changing, obviously, uh, diagnosis to receive. And that's like, a, obviously, we would involve mental health. But again, for these easy cancers, these ones where we expect a life, ex you know, almost a normal life expectancy, we we don't kind of, as, and I'm saying we as the surgeons and also as the endocrinologist providers that are seeing these patients and making those diagnoses, we don't automatically jump to, hey, we need these, um, you know, other other professions to kind of get involved early because we um, unfortunately have not been in Roberta's shoes or in, in someone's shoes who. Um, has gone through that and said, you know what, I really, you know, this isn't easy, this isn't straightforward, this isn't, oh, just nothing, you know, right? Um, I'm just, is everybody familiar with what thyroid cancer is or, the, the, yeah, like the, 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 the actual, yeah, and where the thyroid is, because I think there's also a lot of people, and even some endocrinologists, I've heard somebody say this, that is high up in endocrinology, he's like, I don't even think we really know what all the thyroid does, and that was, he said that to our support group, and I'm like, oh, that's really not a good thing to say to us, <laughs> but, so I don't know what familiarity you guys have. No, let's do a quick, a quick go through, and then that might also highlight another um, potential member of the treatment team that I know okay. you thought would be good. Okay, all right, so this is, um, and, and I'll skip through some of this, just to make it really, really basic, but, um, that. So the thyroid gland sits in the neck. It's kind of like a butterfly or bow tie shaped gland. Um, it is in charge of a lot of your metabolism. So heat and cold intolerance, um, energy levels, uh, skin, whether it's oily or dry, that sort of thing. A lot of that is um, in part, but not in full, um, directed by the thyroid gland. It is uh, receiving uh, <coughs> messages from your brain that tells it to make more stuff. And then it makes that stuff and puts it into your bloodstream. This is just a picture of what um, what it looks like kind of on the inside of, of the gland histology. So the prevalence is, is actually pretty high. So in women, it's approximately 50 per, or, sorry, not 50 percent, 5 percent of, of women in the U.S. Um, and 1 percent in men. Um, that's a palpable thyroid nodule. Now, um, nodules are not always cancer. In fact, they're most often not cancer. So in that 5 percent of women and 1 percent of men, only about 5 percent of all of those will end up being a thyroid cancer. This is, um, you know, with with all of those, it sounds like not all that many, but if you think about how many people there are in the United States, it actually turns out to be quite a lot of patients per year. Um, of those, 5% uh, of those nodules, um, 
that do end up being cancer, about 85% of them end up being papillary thyroid cancer, which is the most common, um, and we'll kind of go through the other kinds, but papillary is the most common. So these are the different kinds of thyroid cancer that you can see. So anaplastic, critical cell, poorly differentiated, medullary, follicular, and papillary. You can see papillary makes up the vast majority of it. Um, the ones in the red boxes there, follicular, critical cell, and papillary, make up a group called differentiated thyroid cancer. In other words, it's a thyroid cancer that actually still kind of looks like and acts like the cells that it derived from. So it, it hasn't kind of mutated so much that it is not acting like or not looking like a thyroid cell. Um, in terms of the incidence of thyroid cancer, one of the reasons that it's even more important that we're having this panel is that the incidence has been increasing dramatically. So over the past 30 to 40 years, we've seen a humongous increase, um, especially in the United States, but also like worldwide. Um, and almost the entirety of that increase has been within papillary thyroid cancer and specifically very small, less than one centimeter papillary thyroid cancers. So we're seeing a huge increase in papillary. We're seeing more and more of those being these tiny ones. And part of that is because we're, we're increasing the amount of uh, medical imaging that we're using. So a lot of people are as they get an MRI when they were in a car accident or um, maybe they're, they're getting ultrasounds more often um, by their PCP or by their OB or something like that. But we're seeing them diagnosed um, much earlier, much smaller, um, and potentially in a way that it isn't necessarily correlated with long-term outcomes. So if you have an 85 or 90-year-old patient with a one-centimeter nodule, um, that patient more than likely is going to die of something else and may not even be worth doing a biopsy of the nodule um, unless it has very specific features that would make you think it's very aggressive. So um, there's kind of a, a little bit of an overuse of medical um, uh, resources here, but also um, you know, also a real increase in incidence. So in addition to that, that uh, those tiny papillaries that are being diagnosed, we're also at the same time seeing a smaller but true increase in larger cancers as well. So it's both a real um, increase in incidence and also an increase in diagnosis. Um, so that's a, an important thing to, to kind of remember. Um, that's, this is kind of what I just said. It's not just over diagnosis. So when we when we see a patient that has thyroid nodules, um, we we look at an ultrasound first. It's a pretty inexpensive, um, non-invasive way to evaluate nodules, and it's actually the best way to evaluate nodules. It gives us a, a lot of um, detail and clarity on what sort of is going on in that nodule. And there are different profiles based on what it looks like on ultrasound that tells us, oh, this is just a cyst, or this looks really really aggressive, um, and so we group these into categories, high suspicion, all the way down to something that we can look at with an ultrasound and say, this is benign, 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 no need to even put a needle in it. Um, and so we, we um, have this staging, this is um, from the American Thyroid Association, this was published in 2015, and it pretty much has been validated over and over and over again. There are um, a couple of other staging systems, most notably the radiology group has kind of put out one. It's a little bit less, uh, it's a little bit more conservative in terms of its approach to thyroid nodules. I still use the ATA. Um, there are a lot of groups that will say, oh, I don't want to needle that because by the radiology score, it's not high enough yet. I may be a little bit less conservative. I say needle it, I want to know, but uh, that's, you'll, you'll find that provider by provider. You'll, you'll have a different um, feeling there. Um, we also check everybody's um, TSH, which is what your brain is telling your thyroid, and T4, which is what your thyroid is putting out into your bloodstream. Um, we Can also- I ask a quick question yeah. about that discrepancy of kind of practice models. Yes. So where does patient, does patient preference Absolutely. fit into that? So, you know, so if, before if a we patient's get us, with a more conservative doctor, but they yeah. feel, no, I need a little, I want to know the same way you feel. But we do try and have that conversation. Um, you know, I, I still even will get patients who say, I know it, it looks entirely benign on the ultrasound, but I still want a needle biopsy. And we try and talk with them. I, th I think that the, the gray area between those two staging systems, it's pretty small. It's literally 0.5 centimeters one way or 0.5 centimeters the other. So it's a little bit kind of, if they want it, then I'll, you know, sure, absolutely. I don't know if other providers feel more strongly one way or the other, um, but I think that there is an, an amount of sort of 
appropriate counseling that, hey, this, this nodule, it, number one, is very small, or number two, it looks entirely benign on the ultrasound. I'm happy to re-ultrasound it in a couple of months, see if anything's changed. Um, but putting them through an actually invasive procedure, not, and not only something that's invasive and therefore you know, could do, do harm to the patient, um, they can have a hematoma afterwards, you know, so it's not without its own risks, um, but also cost the medical system a lot of money, um, that, that whole discussion has to be sort of with a little bit of knowledge. So it's not just kind of, I want it, therefore I get it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely something that, it, it tends to be a pretty easy conversation though. Um, the harder conversation comes with, with surgery, <laughs> for sure. Um, thyroid globulin is then um, a, a um, marker of how much thyroid tissue is actually in the body. <clears throat> Um, it's an excellent marker for papillary thyroid cancer um, and for follicular thyroid cancer. It is not at all a marker for medullary and for anaplastic thyroid cancer, though, so it's kind of an important thing to remember. We have a good marker for some things, but not for everything. The staging is interesting because so staging of cancer has to do with three things. The T um, is the size of the actual primary tumor itself, the, the actual um, thyroid tumor. The N has to do with metastases that go to the lymph nodes, N for nodes, um, and that's lymph nodes specifically in the neck. And then M refers to metastases, and that's metastases further away in the body, so to the liver, the lungs, the belly, that sort of thing. T, N, and M staging for thyroid cancer, specifically for this differentiated thyroid cancer, which includes that papillary, follicular, and herthal cell is one of the only cancers that includes age as part of its um, criteria. So when you go to stage a patient, whether they're um, older or younger than, it's now 55, this says 45, and actually the next slide is the new one. So 55 has now been the, the cutoff for um, staging one way versus staging the other. And that age is at the time of diagnosis. So if a patient turns, 55 the next year, they don't automatically get upstaged. It's when they actually were diagnosed. So um, it's kind of interesting in, in that sort of um, differentiation between the prognosis. So staging is, a, is an important way to tell us a little bit about what's the prognosis of the patient. So you expect somebody with a stage one to have a very good prognosis. You expect somebody with a stage four to have a worse prognosis. In the case of differentiated thyroid cancer, the overall five-year survival um, is 98.6%, which is kind of unheard of. This is why people talk about it as if it's nothing, because there's such an incredibly high cure rate and uh, incredibly <coughs> high uh, more um, long-term uh, disease-free disease, disease -free survival. Um, and so, so people don't tend to um, think about it in the ways that we're talking about it today um, for that very reason. So I'll kind of go through that. So uh, uh, just to um, just to contrast these two, you can see um, in papillary, <coughs> we have in that last column there, group stage one, two, all the way up to 4B. Um, and depending upon what your disease presentation is, you may have a different stage. If you go to anaplastic thyroid cancer, even just having a diagnosis of anaplastic thyroid cancer, doesn't matter whether it's metastasized, doesn't matter if it's in a lymph node, it's already stage four. So just to kind of keep that in, in your mind. So management of thyroid cancer um, generally includes surgery, hormone replacement, and potentially radioactive <coughs> iodine. Radioactive iodine is becoming less and less used these days, um, and that's kind of based on a lot of um, results that we've, we've looked at over many, many decades. Um, it generally can include, but does not always include external beam radiation, and can, but does not always include targeted chemotherapy. So um, it remains mostly a surgical disease. A lot of patients never have to have any of the other modalities, so they don't have to have chemo, radiation, or radio excuse me, radioactive iodine. Um, thyroidectomy has been done for a long time. This is from um, 1866. Dr. Samuel Gross over at Jefferson Medical College said, no honest and sensible surgeon, it seems to me, would ever engage in it. Um, and so this, uh, basically, there was a super high mortality rate from uh, thyroid surgery because of blood loss. Um, and the, the techniques have thankfully um, gotten much better over the years. Um, it, Emil Coker, um, who is uh, the, the namesake for the incision that we make, the Coker incision um, for our thyroidectomy, 
uh, he actually won the Nobel Prize for his work in the physiology and pathology of, um, of the thyroid gland and also in improving the techniques in thyroid surgery. Um, and then we have Dr. William Halstead in the 1920s who stated that the extirpation of the thyroid gland for goiter, and that's specifically for something like Graves' disease, um, typifies better than any other operation the supreme triumph of the surgeon's art. And basically what he's trying to say is it's really still pretty hard. It's, um, it's, it can be a big struggle, um, and there are lots of things that can go wrong, so um, it's important to do it well. Um, the goals are basically to remove the primary tumor, also to remove any lymph nodes that are involved at the time of surgery. This is done to accurately stage the disease, as we talked about before, whether they have lymph nodes or not. Um, it permits long-term survival surveillance, um, and that's specifically with that TG marker. Again, it's not useful for medullary or anaplastic. Um, and then it's to limit uh, the disease and treatment-related morbidity and mortality, and also minimize the risk of occurrence or metastases. So um, those are kind of all the reasons that we do it. It kind of comes in two flavors. Um, these flavors are a little bit uh, morphing these days. It used to be that even having a very tiny thyroid cancer meant you got the whole gland out no matter what. Um, and nowadays, we actually are going more and more towards more conservative um, surgical therapy. So we're doing thyroid lobectomies, which basically means taking half of that butterfly out leaving the other half in. Part of the reason that we do that is, number one, we found that there's no difference in terms of recurrence or survival. Um, the second reason that we do it is because not everybody really wants to be on a pill for the rest of their life. And no matter what anybody tells you, natural hormone in your body, uh, which can be uh, modulated on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, um, is, is very different from taking a single pill with a single dose every single day of your life. Um, and probably Roberta can tell you a lot about that, but it's, it's one of the things that a lot of thyroid cancer patients will, um, will have a problem with to say, you know, it just it isn't the same as your natural hormone. So if we can keep your natural gland in your body making natural hormone, that's, that's excellent. So thyroid specimens, uh, no, no two thyroid cancers are the same. These are various um, thyroid cancers that I've removed from patients. Um, important to kind of know your anatomy and know what can be there and what, uh, what isn't. I'm going to skip over this. Um, in terms of lymph nodes, there are multiple different areas where lymph nodes can be found in the body. Um, and specifically in the neck, we divide it into regions. We talk about the central neck and the lateral neck. That's kind of the easiest way. Um, sometimes we do um, lymph node dissection prophylactically, which basically means we don't necessarily know that there's cancer in them, but we take them out anyway. Um, in thyroid cancer, we're less probably less and less of the time doing that. We used to do a prophylactic uh, lymph node dissection in the, in the middle of the neck. Now we don't do that quite as much um, because we haven't found that it uh, basically has as much yield. Um, but certainly if we ever do find that there are positive nodes, we go in and we remove those. Um, that's generally done if, if you think about um, lymph nodes as popcorn that you've spilled on a big rug in your living room. Rather than going through and picking out one at a time, we actually just roll the whole rug up, bring it to the pathologist, and they shake it out. So that's kind of the, the way that I describe it to my patients, is that we don't actually just take single lymph node after single lymph node. We go in and we remove all the tissue in that area and bring it to the pathologist, and they find the lymph nodes within that. Um, these are kind of the places um, in which we um, are looking for, um, uh, I don't know what exactly they're specifically looking at, but the, the Lymph nodes in the central portion of the neck can be in multiple places. That's all this picture is really trying to say. It can be in the mediastinum, which is called level seven. It can be right around on either side of the trachea, underneath the thyroid, or above the thyroid. And that's really all that picture is showing. Reoperative surgery um, sometimes is necessary. Sometimes we do need to go in and do what we call a completion thyroidectomy. In other words, we took out half, but now we're seeing something on the other side that makes us um, very concerned about it, or when we took out that first half, we saw something on that pathology that made us say, this is aggressive, or it's larger than we thought, and we need to basically remove the rest of the gland. Um, that does increase sometimes the risk. It depends on, on the first surgery and how extensive it was, but it can increase your risk of having um, certain postoperative uh, complications. Uh, generally, the patients stay in the hospital for at least one night if they have the whole gland out. Um, if they have just half of the gland out, it's oftentimes outpatient surgery, and patients are allowed to go home the same day, which is excellent. 
Uh, most of the time, people are about back to their work or their job in a couple of days to a week. Um, again, depending upon which surgery that they had, they may go home on thyroid hormone medication, but if they just had a lobectomy, then generally it's not needed. Um, sometimes they'll go home with calcium supplement, again, with lobectomy, generally not needed. Pain medication is usually very minimal. Um, I would say about 99% of my patients take Tylenol and put ice on their incision and take no narcotics whatsoever. And I've actually been um, pretty excited about studying that as part of my, um, my research. Um, you can have complications. So we, we always talk about, you know, do no harm. And that's sort of the first uh, tenant of doing surgery. So you don't want to have complications, but they do sometimes happen. We can have a hematoma of the neck. We can get hypoparathyroidism, which basically means your calcium levels drop too low. Um, and we can have injury to the nerves that go to the voice box. Um, we talked about this already. The multidisciplinary care um, and, and what I kind of um, would be a, a big component of is having a weekly tumor board. That tumor board consists not only of the surgeons and the endocrinologists, but actually includes a bigger team. So radiologists, people who do the ultrasounds or CAT scans or nuclear medicine scans, um, the pathologists, so the people who are actually looking at those specimens, both the needle biopsy and also the surgical biopsy that comes out at the time of surgery under the microscope. And it is important to have people who, again, are doing that in kind of a high volume way. They've looked at it um, a million times. They can tell you this is classic papillary versus hobnail papillary versus tall cell papillary. There's all these different kinds of papillary that are coming out now. It also may include a molecular biologist, so somebody in pathology who specifically is looking at the genes that are mutated within that cancer and can tell you this one's got very aggressive mutations versus this one has very bland mutations or mutations that we see not, uh, not usually causing too much problem. Um, it also potentially could include a radiation oncologist or um, a medical oncologist and ideally would include people um, in behavioral health, but also in, in my experience, I also think would ideally include a physical therapist and also a speech therapist. So there are a lot of um, physical therapy things that I think can be improved upon and also speech therapy, swallowing and voice, um, which can be um, could, could seriously use some improvement in terms of our multidisciplinary approach. Um, so you would see that all as a singular meeting oh, in excellent. the weekly tumor board where yep. the other disciplines are there as yep. well. And that, that is how we operate currently with our head and neck tumor board, mm -hmm. um, which is a bit more robust, but I would, I mean, it would be amazing to see that also occur for, for thyroid as well. Um, that's, that's it. That's all I got. So hopefully that helps bring us. Yeah. Um, I think there was one other discipline that you mentioned you think would be good to have involved that hasn't been met and mentioned yet. Um, nutrition? Well, I have a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I do think that nutrition is a really important um, part of this because you're removing the gland that actually kind of monitors your metabolism and all that sort of thing. And not in every circumstance, but in a lot of circumstances, people will gain weight after they lose their thyroid. Um, that's what happened to me. Um, so, and, and there's so much talk about like what's healthy food and all that sort of thing. And I fought a lot with, you know, uh, this person that helped me lose weight before I had my thyroid diagnosis. And he's like, oh, you know, let's just eat these prepared foods. And I'm like, I don't want to eat any junk anymore. And so there's a lot of that sort of thing. Um, the mental health is really the biggest thing that I've talked about. But I have a functional, uh, a doctor who practices functional medicine is my primary care. So she's looking at a lot of supplementation. She's looking at minerals and nutrients and all that sort of thing. Um, there, are, there are just things that I take supplement-wise that help me feel better. Um, and so, but you can't just kind of willy-nilly do that on your own. You, would, you need somebody to kind of recommend those things and look at those things. And uh, an endocrinologist is almost 100% of the time never going to look at that. It, it, it doesn't matter if you ask for it or not. Um, and that that's one of the big issues that I have with just endocrinology is that, you know, it is a numbers game to them. So for us, suppression therapy is part of the, the thing. Um, the staging changed between my original diagnosis and where we are now. So I went from stage four, I think I was 4A, and now I'm not in stage four, which is 
great, um, but I'm still at a very high risk because I had recurrent disease and I've had two surgeries and whatnot. So we're doing suppression therapy, which means my TSH level is very low. Um, so they keep me in hyperthyroid and hyperthyroid symptoms are terrible, um, anxiety and all that sort of thing. But I will fight with my endocrinologist and he loves me for it. Um, and I'll say to him, you know, I, can we just bump this up a little bit or do this? For the last four years, we pretty much changed my um, thyroid medication dose every three months. And that's really, really hard on the body. Um, and so now he's, he gives in a little bit more to me. He was only giving me um, Synthroid, which is just straight T4. And I begged for T3 and he agreed and I started doing much better with that. Um, so I think that listening to patients and not just going in and saying like, are your hands shaking? Okay, that means your, your levels are too, whatever. Um, you know, I'm not just that number anymore. Don't just look at my blood work. You know, let's look at how I feel and where's my D3 and how's my B12 and all that sort of thing. And he doesn't want any of that. He's just like not interested at all in that sort of thing. So I think nutrition is important. I think mental health is important. Um, I think, um, I did put my dream team here. My body therapy um, and caregiver support is huge. Um, at the time of diagnosis, I had, my son was, I guess he was like nine. Um, and when I told him I had cancer and I said, you know, do you know what that is? And he's like, oh, is that the disease where your hair falls out? I said, well, I don't have that type of it. I said, but you know, no. And he's like, are you going to die? And I'm like, not from this. He's like, All right, I'm good. But I think like over time, you know, not everybody reacts like that. And, you know, and having my spouse understand that, you know, my, my anxiety, my moods, it's all over the place, even worse than before. Um, so those are things that I think are important for caregiver stuff. So potentially in addition to nutrition um, and maybe behavioral health, which a couple of family therapists, creative therapists, the social work, but also maybe involvement with either or both psychiatry um, mm -hmm. and um, a pharmacist. Because that's yeah. part of what I heard you talking about is there's various medications, medications for the thyroid that need to be you know, coordinated, but then if you're dealing with anxiety or a pre-existing mental health needs and you're taking anti-anxiety meds or anti-depression, that has to be coordinated. How are drugs interacting? And, and we really need somebody who's, or some a coordinated team that has awareness of everything going on and how the different drugs may interact and nutrition supplements and everything mm -hmm. coming together. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have a question? Okay. So, well, actually, I have a pre-question. So, can, I just wondered, is, is there a predisposition, like genetics or lifestyle? Yeah, so there, there are some, um, some thyroid cancers that do run in families. Um, it does not tend to be the, the vast majority, though. The majority are sporadic. Um, in terms of exposures, the, the ones that we know for sure um, are relatively rare, and they're, like, exposure to ionizing radiation so like being a child during the chernobyl accident oh, okay. or um, actually there's a recent paper published on um, patients who live um, like in harrisburg around three mile islands and that um, if their explosion happened so the um the exposure to those types of things but also um probably we think um things like uh ct techs if they're you know that's why everybody wears like the radiology tech where the um, uh, shields, um, but even like dental techs and stuff. Anytime yeah. you're around those radiation um, uh, emitting things, um, even like th there was one study that was done that looked at um, airline pilots and and like airline crew because um, above a certain number of feet, you're more exposed to the radiation. <laughs> and da, da, da. So that one didn't really exactly show anything, but I think that there's probably something that is there. Um, the other things that we don't really have a good answer for is why is it so much more common in women? Um, so far, nobody has actually found a direct association with estrogen, progesterone, you know, like any of the things hormone wise that we have that they don't, but um, it, it, we're still kind of trying to figure that out. Um, there's a, um, a group of researchers, um, one of whom is uh, a thyroid surgeon uh, that used to be at Duke, and I think he's now at San Francisco, named Julianne Sosa. 
and she has been looking at, uh, this is a really interesting study, looking at the um, PBDEs, polybromylated, polydiethylbromylated, something, something, anyway, esters that are in our environment, basically it's fire retardants. Mm -hmm. So um, in like our uh, materials and like the fabrics that were, you know, that were, were constantly around them. Um, and they are potentially one of the things that we're just as a population more and more exposed to and potentially that could be a reason for the increasing incidence. Uh, that's at least like one other yeah. situation. So. Okay. A follow-up question to that, are there particular countries that have a higher incidence of thyroid cancer? Um, like, do we see it more in Asian countries in the uh, United States? So we do, um, and I, um, I don't know if you saw one of my, like one of the first slides is about the incidence. So we know that the incidence is higher in um, uh, developed countries, and we know that it's even within those developed countries, even higher within, uh, let's say, uh, more urban settings. Um, and we don't necessarily think it's because those urbanites are being exposed to something. We think it's because those urbanites have more access to healthcare um, and therefore get scans a lot more often uh, than if you live in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically, one of the areas where it is the highest is the one that we live in right wow. now. So um, the Philadelphia, Baltimore, DC, New York area um, has an extremely high incidence. Um, there's also uh, been a lot of studies that have kind of come out looking at the incidence in an area and the um, litigation in that area. So basically providers kind of deciding, I'm gonna order the scan because if I don't order it and there's something there, then I'm you know, gonna get sued. So they'll order a scan and then they see something, well, we've got follow up on that. So there, there may be also kind of a, like I was saying, like maybe a, an over-diagnosis um, an overdiagnosis is a hard thing to kind of, this could be like a whole discussion in and of itself. So I don't want to put out there something that's like really um, controversial, but basically we're seeing it earlier um, than it would have otherwise kind of presented to our fingertips when, when doing a, a physical exam because we're often finding it on these, uh, these incidental omas that we're finding on, on imaging. What, um, what does the life of someone who is untreated or undiagnosed with specifically so, papillary cancer like, look like? So there have been some amazing studies, and by amazing I mean well done and long follow-up and big cohorts of patients out of um, Japan um, that have looked at just what do, what do they do if we just follow them? Um, and they're the about 10% of diagnosed papillary thyroid cancers. So needle goes in, it says, yep, that's definitely papillary in there. So diagnosis of papillary, in five years, only 10% of them grow. And even those, only 10% of them grow by about three millimeters. So very, they tend to be very slow growing. Now, there is always that caveat that that one patient presented with a one centimeter nodule, and yet they already had dis metastasis. And so that's where the, that genetic and the molecular stuff comes in, knowing what nasty mutation did that guy have, <laughs> that, that this is how they present it, because that's kind of what tends to emotionally drive us to say, oh, we need to take this a little bit more, we need to be more drastic, we need to be more, do more surgery, we need to, you know. So as like, we get more precise in our medicine, do you think that there may be patients who are advised to just like Quite hang possible. out? And, Quite possible. Yeah. And in fact, so right now in the United States, there are multiple centers which are rolling out active surveillance programs. It doesn't mean to lose, see you later, have a nice life. It right. means I'll see you in six months. We're going to ultrasound this. And if it's grown, we'll do something about it. If it hasn't, you get to keep your thyroid for a little yeah. bit longer. Yeah. And, and that, that kind of program is it's only possible when, again, you have a good team, yeah. they're all coordinated, and number two, you have a patient who is willing to hear the C word and keep their thyroid in, which is mm. a big thing. I think a lot of patients, when they hear that they have cancer, they say, I want it out. I want it out now, I want it out yesterday. Um, but, but I think you know having that, having the appropriate patient, the appropriate team, it is very safe to follow these. 
um, the, the older you are, and this is a little bit counterintuitive because of our staging, but the older you are, the less likely that it's actually gonna grow up. So the younger patient- this far, so. Yeah, exactly, and, and, that, and that's kind of the idea is that, you know, the younger you are, you've got 50 years for this thing to grow. So the more likely it is that at some point in time, it's gonna grow enough that you need to have your, uh, your surgery done. But um, if you diagnose this again in an 82 year old, my opinion, if I'm 82 years old and you diagnose me with a one centimeter papillary, first of all, I, hopefully I won't even go down that road. I'll say, yeah, those are thyroid nodules and I don't really care about them. But, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things like, do you, do you put an octogenarian under the knife for something that um, potentially will never cause them clinical disease? I think in my case too, like the, my surgeon at Hopkins had said to me initially that he thought I had cancer seven to 10 years before it was actually detected. And so, but, but when it finally was, it was metastatic. So I had it in lymph nodes and that sort of thing. So it's one of those things where had it been, you know, it, it was, it was unusual because now, you know, hindsight is 2020 and I looking back over all these different medical records, you know, it, when I, I guess I was 39, I was diagnosed at 46, but when I was 39, um, I had a near fatal pulmonary embolism and when they did a CAT scan, they actually saw um, nodules on the lymph node or on my thyroid, but that wasn't of concern because that's not what I was there for. So had that been followed up with possibly a, a, you know, an ultrasound right then, you know, they would have been able to follow it and maybe before it had gone into the lymph nodes, they could have done something with it. So, but it was funny, like I had a, I had a huge goiter that I didn't even know about. Like, they're like, how, how are you swallowing? Like, you know, how do you breathe? I'm like, I don't know. I just noticed that it's harder to sing, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, so it was interesting. Um, we have a, another medically oriented question online, which I'm going to save for a moment because I want to ask a, a general question, maybe have Laura answer first. Um, from a mental health perspective, and then maybe Roberta from a patient perspective. You mentioned this type of cancer is sometimes called easy, or you got the good cancer, as if you know there is a good thing about having cancer. Um, what kind of impact might using that kind of language and talking about it in that way have, good or bad or otherwise, on both the patient and perhaps you know their family members when you go to talk to your child and it's like well, I have cancer but it's it's okay it's the easy one you can treat it you know potentially that's a, a nice thing to be able to say to a child or um, a spouse or or someone else but you know I think that could probably have two sides to that coin of using that kind of language around around this I mean, diagnosis. I think it certainly makes sense from the medical perspective as we're hearing when you're looking at the whole range of cancers and prognoses and you're talking about a 98% prognosis, right? That's significant. Um, but the flip side could be that um, for a patient or for families, it could maybe feel a little bit invalidating because it's nothing feels good about hearing the word cancer um, and a diagnosis for yourself. Um, and it can also, you know, sometimes it can mean that the experience with the patient is missed or um, maybe not paid attention to in the same way as someone who had a more serious quote unquote diagnosis. Um, so it's still important to really kind of take time to understand the nuances of the patient experience. And Roberta, you can still benefit from that and you can more as well. Um, but to, to maybe um, talk about it more in terms of lower risk or better prognosis um, and keeping it more in terms of those medical terms versus calling it good versus bad, which kind of categorizes it, right? Um, so I, I think that could be one kind of quick way to help in terms of languaging that a little bit differently. On the other hand, it's certainly useful for the patient to have that information, right, about prognosis. And um, when there's that initial diagnosis or sort of that crisis phase, they might not be able to take in more than the C word that's been um, given to them. But at some point, they're going to be able to kind of slow down and with the help of their support system and their doctor want to understand the full nuances and treatment options and prognosis and that's when that information could be really comforting and useful to them and, and also in kind of bringing it to their family members as well. I think that's really significant too because for the oncologist who's seeing 50 cancer patients in the week this patient's down here in terms of risk and there's many others above them. For the patient only knows one thing it's still very serious to them and so that difference of perspective you know that that we as healthcare professionals sometimes 
our, can only function from our own perspective, but to remember the perspective of the patient and what their experience is, I think was a key point that you mentioned. I think too, um, so for me, I was told, well, this is an easy cancer. If you're gonna get one, this is the one you want. And so that kind of initially lulled me into a false sense of security where I was like, okay, well, this, this is all. And, and even with the two surgeries I've had and the, you know, though I had a tumor that was behind my trachea and at the point before they, they did the surgery, they didn't know if it was actually in the trachea or whatever. So even with those types of, um, you know, I guess, more difficult surgeries, I still knew the prognosis was going to be really good. I think where, where I get mad about the good label is in the, the hormone replacement, because there's nothing good about that. And there's nothing good about trying to replace the whole function of a gland in your entire body with just a pill or two. So that's where I think we get you know, really upset. And I think people don't understand the type of cancer that we have. And they're like, oh, you know, I didn't know you could get cancer. And it was interesting when I was going to um, Hopkins, you know, having lived up here and the doctor saying, you know, you, you should really be down here for after your surgery for about three, three to five days because I had calcium issues and they might want to keep me in longer. So I was looking for a place for my husband to stay and I was like, oh, I'm gonna go to the Cancer um, Society and whatever. And I called them and I said, you know, I'm interested in staying at Hope Lodge while I'm doing this surgery and stuff. And they're like, okay, well, we just need a letter from your oncologist that, you know, this is, you're, you're gonna be here while you're receiving treatment. And I said, well, my treatment is surgery. And then I just need to be monitored there. And they're like, well, this is for when you're having treatment. And I said, yes, but I'm having treatment. And so, Ultimately, they said I couldn't stay there because I wasn't getting treatment, and um, I that, mean, chemo or radiation, yeah, primarily. right? And and I didn't have an oncologist, and so they're like, "Well, how do you have cancer?" And that was an ex I that twice that once with Hope Lodge and once with one of those places that give you respite trips and things like that. They're like they couldn't get it to their head that I don't have an oncologist, and so how could you have cancer? So I think those are the things that also make it pretty, um, you know, like, just, you know, marginalize my own experience with it. And I have a chronic disease now, you know, like I will be monitored for the rest of my life. I will do blood work every three to six months for the rest of my life. And so that is something that people are like, oh, you know, just whatever. So, but, the, but it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, I think I think of cancer. You know, we we talk about it. We being clinicians talk about it in these degrees, like you were saying, like oh, better or worse um, types. But for the patient, it's it's more like pregnancy. You either are or you are not, mm -hmm. and there is no you know it's either you have it or you don't, and there's no like oh, it's the good you know like it's just the, it's that language. I think is very unhelpful. Just have a follow-up to that. I was diagnosed two years ago when I was 26, and I was told it was a, a good kind, you know, it was a good one to get. And I think what you said is really important, like reframing it as having a very good prognosis. Because I expected to go in and have my surgery and have everything just be, you know, that was it, then I'd be done from there. And <clears throat> I found I, tr I attempted to go back to a post-back pre-med program two and a half weeks after I had my surgery. And with a very heavy course load, and I had to drop all but one class because I underestimated the effect that the surgery would have had on my energy levels and just my mental health. And I think if I, you know, would have been more prepared for it's a good prognosis, but it's going to be rough for a little while, I would have no, I wouldn't have felt as crazy. And the second thing is, um, FICA has been a lifesaver for me. Going to those groups changed my life. So. When a patient is diagnosed, if they could be told that there's this group, we actually have two support groups that meet in this area, I think that would be really important um, to know that you can go in person and meet people who have had, I mean, it's the same disease, but everyone's is different, but it's still very helpful in terms of um, mental health and moving forward with the diagnosis. Again, that's where there's the benefit to having an interdisciplinary team, and especially even at that, at that meeting of delivering the diagnosis, you know, you don't want 
necessarily 20 healthcare professionals in the room with one patient and their <laughs> spouse or family member, but you know, there is a right mix where you might have an oncologist or an endocrinologist, you might have the surgeon who's gonna do the surgery, and then you might have a mental health professional who can share some of those resources, all there at the time of delivering the bad news, so to speak. Um, yeah, I just had a, some thoughts on this language thing too. To me, it's like thinking about what is this good or this easy, sort of what is it serving as like a placeholder for and what, so, you know, as a cancer survivor myself, although a different kind, I mean, when, when I was, you know, in these conversations around cancer, you know, I felt like my oncologist, my care team was often talking about that acute period of care of treatment, you know, you're going to be in chemotherapy for six months, we're going to reevaluate. I think for a lot of survivors, it's that period after that is so complicated, the idea of, oh, I now live with this chronic condition. Like no one ever told me what it would be like to have strep throat for the first time, having having post like gone through chemotherapy and having this freak out in the mirror, like, is this like, you know, doing this all the time? And like, I wasn't prepared for that. And I have to do that forever now. So um, yeah, I think it's, it, it's important to think about it, you know, from the patient perspective of like, I have to live with this long term for the rest of my life. And I think it's important also because there's, for, for us, because the, um, hormone stuff is so, you yeah. know, like it monitors your moods and all that sort of thing. You know, there, there will be times where I'll be great for like six months, no problem. I'm sleeping awesome, whatever. And then there'll be times where my panic is so bad. And you can see when I'm ramping up for my annual appointment and yeah. I have to go get blood work and then the ultrasound, that's when things kind of get really weird. But even still, it was, um, after my second surgery, and it was probably, I don't know, like maybe three months after, all of a sudden I had my first and the worst panic attack I've ever had in my entire life. And I had no idea. I mean, literally, I thought I was dying. And I didn't know what it was from. But then when I kind of talked about it in therapy, I had been a cancer patient for, you know, three years, four years, whatever it was. And that was my identity. You know, I was like, I was fighting cancer. And then all of a sudden I went back to the doctor and my endocrinologist is like, there's no evidence of disease right now. And I'm like, can I say I'm cured? He's like, well, no, we'll never say that. I said, can I, am I in remission? He's like, it's too early to say that too. I said, okay, fine. But, but now my identity was obliterated, you know, because I went from being a cancer patient to now I'm a survivor and I have no foundation anymore. So that was something that that was years after my initial diagnosis. And that was something that I think is also, you know, this is not, I mean, life is tough and we all have problems and I think everybody should be in and out of therapy as they need it. That's just me. Um, but I think that if you look at the kind of the path and the trajectory, trajectory of people with my, my kinds of cancer and I know that you can speak to this as well and the mental health issue is huge and it's beyond just like the the fear of having the disease and the risk of recurrence because I am at a very high risk for recurrence um, so it's more of a more of like this it's always it's always over my shoulder I will always be looking for it I mean, your personal experiences are all supported by the evidence, right, that says that there is that critical period post-treatment, right? There's that acute phase, there's that crisis phase, and it makes sense. Everyone needs to pour all their resources into coping and surviving in this moment, but then when treatment's over, it's almost like the mothership leaves, right? All these resources and check-ins and people who are, you know, constantly communicating to you about this are gone or gone for longer periods of time, and now it's navigating this new normal. So for the patient and family, it's reorganizing and how we're going to cope, how we want to make survivorship look like, even with all of its kind of imperfections and struggles as well. With all this knowledge though, like where, where's the intervention and where are those expectations laid out? Because I think, you know, you know, we've now heard from three survivors that have yeah. all had issues with like the expectations were not like delivered and managed like through the survivorship period and through this you know, treatment period. Um, I, you know, I, I was directed to therapy when I stopped treatment, but there was no therapist involved for the six months I was on chemotherapy that could have been there having these conversations along the way. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a lot of catch up that yeah. we need to do in terms of integrated behavioral health. Yeah. We hear of it as a big buzzword and it's really important. There's yeah. certainly more funding happening for it, um, but I think you're speaking to absolutely the reason it needs to be more of the baseline rather than the exception because um, it's a really real impact. Yeah, coordination of care before, during, and after, right. and transition. Yeah. 
And it's also like anything else. If you give a team of people, you know, six tasks and just say, get these tasks done, and nobody says, okay, you do this one, you do that one, and you do that one, those six tasks might not get done. You know, or one person can do them all when they're not entirely qualified to do the same thing. This team has to be able to say, okay, my job is primarily done here, but I, can you pick it up with the patient from here and have continued communication? From and are we uh, assessing six. psychosocially at the follow-up yeah. visit six months, a year out, yeah. a whole years out? And it's this long. is one of the places, sorry, where, where um, you know, seeing a lot of what this could look like in terms of treating um, more broadly head and neck cancers, we actually have a validating questionnaire that we give every single patient when they come back that actually screens for depression, um, that screens for actually for depression, anxiety, and couple, you know, a lot of other things. And basically, like, it <laughs> makes it really simple for the surgeons. If you score above this, you get preferred, you know, like, it's, it's one of those, like, very simple algorithms, but it, and it may be a little bit watered down, but it gets people in when they, are showing us that they need to get to it. I was going to say something else, so I'll come back to you. But I went, just about yeah. out of time, and I want to relay the question we had from online, um, which is uh, down a different path. But they said, Can someone on the panel discuss the relationship of anti thyroglobulin um, antibodies and the monitoring of TG, specifically concerning accuracy of the TG monitoring, and also thoughts on how to monitor post disease, patients post disease? Have an anti TG antibodies present. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take my leave. I have to go teach a class. Oh, that's okay. So I gotta run. Okay. Thank you. You're so, so having anti TG antibodies basically means that you can't really um, follow the thyroid globulin. Like I was saying, it's a, it's a good marker for papillary, so you just can't use it um, because of the, the antibodies that patients have. It's not that rare, but it's. Uh, we do check for those antibodies. This is a lot more endocrine side of things and not surgery side of things. So I don't know the, they were asking for like numbers and that sort of thing. I don't know those numbers, but um, there are a lot of people out there now who are looking at, can we even follow TG as a marker after a lobectomy? Because um, that was actually one of the reasons that people used to take the entire thyroid gland out is that now we can say like your, your level should be zero because we took the whole thing out. Now, if we see it go up from zero, we can say there's been a recurrence. Um, now, when, when we're sort of in this era of maybe we should be doing lobectomies instead, um, we're trying to figure out, well, can we find a baseline? Can we say this should be your, your zero set point? Um, so I think the, the um, jury is still out a little bit on that. There are some people who are kind of working on an algorithm for it, but a potential for the future. So I don't, sorry, I don't know all of the answer to that question in more detail, but hopefully that was sufficient. Uh, a quick question. On, you guys mentioned in the dream team, you guys would include physical therapy. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things would physical therapists be able to do to kind of help with some of the So I, I make sure that every single one of my patients, I have like a really long post-op packet because I can't possibly tell them everything that I need them to know. And I also can't expect them to remember everything that I tell them. But one of the things that I, I tell people is to expect after surgery to have very sore neck and back muscles. Um, and a lot of people who have had a neck incision even if they don't have a significant amount of pain, you'll see them going like this, doing like the Frankenstein when they're walking around. And it's like, no, 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 you, you, can, you can turn your head. You know, you're, it's okay to do it, but they think that it's not okay. Um, and so I give them in, in that um, packet some very basic um, shoulder and neck exercises to do. Um, and, and some people, especially if they've had neck dissection, so the lateral neck compartments, those patients really can get um, uh, weakness to the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidomastoid muscle um, from the spinal accessory nerve actually being impinged upon by a tumor, by lymph nodes, or being stretched when you're getting lymph nodes out. So those patients we, um, we know will potentially need um, physical therapy down the line. But I think honestly, like, you know, even just for the, the post-op period for straight up regular thyroidectomy, probably could be beneficial um, and that's why I give kind of like at least a mini instruction um, in there. Just to like build that confidence to move basically. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean there was a lot of pain um, and but it's it's like the you know the holding up here and like that kind of thing and I think also long term um, we 
we have a tendency to, you know, if we're putting weight back on, you know, it's going to affect our knee joint, our, you know, the knees and the legs and all that sort of thing. So those are things that we want to look at. And, you know, they said that, um, they said long-term sensoroid use or whatever is you got to watch for bone density mm -hmm. issues and that sort of thing. And that's another reason why, you know, I, I'm always like, oh wait, that's a new joint pain. What's that from? And, you know, yeah, prolonged high doses. So um, what Roberto was talking about in terms of suppression therapy, that basically means taking a very high dose of the, um, of the, the thyroid hormone um, synthroid or, or levothyroxine, basically like the, the hormone that goes out into the bloodstream. The whole reason that you do that is that it basically decreases what your brain is telling your thyroid to do so that they, it basically suppresses that TSH coming down from the pituitary and telling your thyroid to, hey, bro, we need you. Um, and that's, that's the, the, so yeah, high, high doses of that for a long time can certainly lead to osteoporosis. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, don't forget, if you didn't sign in on your way in, please sign up. Uh, just sign the paper so I know you're here. And I'll also grab one of the, um, uh, session evaluation forms, which are underneath the TV on the blue table. Um, and uh, keep check your inbox for the uh, Tuesday Topics Audience Satisfaction Survey. Thank you so much. We'll see you all next week. Thank you.